A warm welcome to everyone around the world to our special Good Friday service. In every city, every location, every country, why don't we stand if you're not already standing? That's it, let's stand in every auditorium, every country and help me welcome everyone around you and everyone around the world, especially everyone who's visiting or who doesn't normally come to church. Come on, give them a big welcome. And if you're looking for a place to belong, please know that you are always welcome here. And while we're standing, let's pray together around the world. Father, we stand in awe of You. We stand grateful for who You are, what You did, and Your magnificent, overwhelming, supreme presence in every life, from the curious to the passionate. Let everyone be touched and impacted by Your Word, And let the weight of this weekend truly not only be a moment for recollection and reflection, but transformation, we pray, in every city and country, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Wonderful. You may be seated all around the world. Easter weekend is the absolute centerpiece of the Christian faith because Jesus' life, death, and resurrection was the divine ransom that settled humanity's eternal debt. He died a death he didn't have to die so we could benefit from a life we didn't have to live. It was a divine exchange. It was in His love at its incomprehensible, unfathomable best. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life because God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. And today, if you're grateful to God, if you're a beneficiary of what Jesus has done, you can unashamedly give Him thanks. You can unashamedly worship Him right where you are because that's who He is and that's what He's done. But let's cast our mind back to Calvary about 2,000 years ago for a few moments as we reflect on the first Good Friday, the day that Jesus was crucified on a cross. He was beaten to a pulp before they even crucified Him. The pain and suffering He went through that He didn't deserve to is what gives Good Friday the sober tone that it often has. If death is painful and if death is the destination, crucifixion is the most torturous way to get there. Crucifixion was invented by the Persians about 300 BC and developed during Roman times into a punishment for the most serious of criminals. Please excuse me for being a bit graphic for a minute, but I need to set the context for Jesus' suffering for the six hours that He was on the cross to give us an appreciation for what I'm about to share. Crucifixion looked like this. Seven-inch nails would be driven through the wrist so that the bones there could support the body's weight. The nail would sever the median nerve, which not only caused immense pain, but would have paralyzed the victim's hands. The feet were nailed to the upright part of the crucifix so that the knees were bent at around 45 degrees. And once the legs gave out, the weight would be transferred to the arms, gradually dragging the shoulders from their sockets. The elbows and wrists would follow a few minutes later, and by now the arms would be six, seven inches longer. The victim would have no choice but to bear his weight on his chest. He would immediately have trouble breathing as the weight caused the rib cage to lift up and force him into an almost perpetual state of inhalation. Suffocation, loss of body fluids, multiple organ failure would no doubt follow. And then the heart and lungs would eventually stop working as blood drained through the wounds. The point is, it's horrific pain, dragged out suffering and cruel in every way. Someone nailed to a cross with their arms stretched out on either side could probably live for no more than 24 hours and Jesus was on there alive for roughly six hours. Jesus taught profound truths, worked remarkable miracles before He went to the cross. He reappeared, re-equipped and restored so many after He got off the cross. But maybe what shows God's heart and nature more than anything is what happened for the six hours while Jesus was actually on the cross. Look at what happened in the midst of the most excruciating pain. 
The last thing Jesus did before he gave up his spirit was the most reverberating prophetic declaration made when he cried out on the cross, it is finished. It is finished. Shame is finished. Guilt is finished. The eternal punishing consequence of our sin and our sickness is finished. Eternal damnation is finished. Separation from God is finished. Oh, those things have a voice, but I wanna tell you, you can declare that His voice is greater. It is finished. The veil in the temple was torn from top to bottom and access is now available to God, to anyone who's humble enough to believe it and hungry enough to receive it. It is finished. But before He cried out, it is finished. There were three incidents recorded in Scripture which show us maybe what God is truly like and models for us an example to follow whatever the suffering you're going through today. The first is in Luke 23, verse 33. It said, when they'd come to a place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. In the middle of suffering, Jesus forgave those who were hurting him those who were nailing those nails into his hands, he forgave them. In the midst of his excruciating pain, he forgave them. Not after, not months after, not after counseling, not after years, in the very moment, in my suffering, in your suffering, do we have the capacity to forgive those who are hurting us in the moment? Let's read on. It said they divided his garments and cast lots and the people stood looking on. Maybe you need to forgive people who've been just looking on at your suffering. And you thought they would do more for you, but they didn't. Can you forgive them in the moment? It goes on to say, even the rulers with them sneered. Can you forgive those who are sneering at you? Those who have sneered at you? He saved others. Let him save himself if he's the Christ, the chosen of God. The soldiers also mocked him. Can you forgive those who are mocking you right now? They came and offered him sour wine saying, if you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the truth is he could have, but he chose to forgive the mockers, the sneerers, just those who are looking on. Forgiving those who hurt you is amazing, anytime. But to do it in the very moment of your suffering is astonishing. And what is remarkable is that too soon wasn't part of his language. Not now, maybe later. See, in a culture that has gone well beyond just caring about the victim, which is a good thing, but now has gone to the other extreme and masquerades compassion as revenge and retribution and vengeance and cancel culture. We would do well today to extend forgiveness to anyone who has hurt us. Maybe someone really close to you, maybe someone far from you. The day that Jesus forgave all of humanity seems like a good day for you and I to let go of the grudge or offense that you are holding on to right now. You know, unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping it kills your enemy. Bitterness is like acid. It does more damage in the vessel in which it's stored than the vessel on which it's poured. I heard someone say, when you finally forgive, you think you're opening the jail cell to set your captive free, only to realize that when you opened the door, it was you who was on the inside the whole time. Who do you need to forgive today? No matter how painful it seems, I'm sure it's nothing like what Jesus was feeling on the cross. But set yourself free from the poison of unforgiveness. Forgive those who hurt you. Today, let's crucify bitterness. Second thing Jesus did while he was on that cross that we can learn from is found in the Gospel of John, chapter 19 through 25 through 27. It said, now there stood by the cross Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved, which is John, standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. I remind you, this is a conversation he's having while he is on the cross, not before and not after. And while he was on the cross, he forgave those who heard him. But while he was also on the cross, this excerpt shows that he cared for those who loved him. And that's my second point. Can we care for those who love us? Now, on its own, that sounds so mild. In fact, it's natural to care for those who love us. In another reference in Luke 6, Jesus says that being kind to those who are good to you is no big deal. 
He said, in fact, even tax collectors, pagans and sinners do that. But it's another thing to be thinking about your loved ones when you are the one suffering. Listen, confession. When I'm suffering, I want all the attention. It's all about me. Forget crucified on a cross. How about COVID on the couch? No matter how high your threshold of pain, we'd all be forgiven for not summoning all our energy and all the attention and all the grace just to navigate the horrific pain of our own suffering with only ourselves understandably in mind, but not Jesus. See, possibly the two people he loved the most, Mary, his mother, and John, the disciple, are there grieving over his death. And instead of making that moment about himself, he's connecting them to each other. You're not lonely, here's your son. You're not alone, here's your mom. And he's ensuring they have family and connection well after he's not around. See, whatever you're going through, I wonder if today we could rise above our own suffering to care for our loved ones because that is Christ-like at its core. See, if forgiving those who hurt you crucifies bitterness, then caring for those who love you crucifies selfishness. The intrinsic selflessness of heart to look beyond his own suffering to care for their emotional well-being and their future gives us the standard of what being Christ-like truly looks like. And the third interaction Jesus had on the cross during the six hours of his suffering is found in Luke 23, verse 39 through 43. It says, Then one of the criminals who are hanged blasphemed him, saying, If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not even fear God, seeing you under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Three things Jesus did while he's on the cross that we can learn from today. Number one, forgive those who hurt you. Number two, care for those who love you, even in the midst of your own suffering. But number three, in the midst of your suffering, reach those around you. You know, this one's a little different. Those hurting you are normally on your mind. Those people who, who, who love you are also normally on your mind. But in the midst of your suffering, to have the needs of complete strangers on your mind? See, this is more than breaking through bitterness or pushing through selfishness. This is the grace to be externally minded when everything within your being so naturally works towards internal preservation of life. And so what are we crucifying? Introversion. Introversion. We're crucifying introversion. See, I'm introverted. And that's okay as a personality, but it's unchrist like as an outlook. wonder if today you could say, you know, my business is suffering, but let me be conscious of other people who are struggling financially and see if I can help them. My health is waning, but let me make a meal for my neighbor. My own family isn't saved, but I'm going to give a Be Our Guest card to strangers for Easter Sunday coming up. See, what are you going through right now that is stopping you from forgiving those who hurt you, caring for those who love you, and reaching those around you? This is so challenging for me personally. It is so challenging for all of us around the world, no matter where your culture, where your country. Jesus taught so much and He did incredible feats before the cross and He reappeared and restored so many after the cross, but perhaps nothing shows the heart of God toward humanity like what He did while He was actually on the cross and the extent of His suffering didn't stop Him. It's the context which makes what He did even more remarkable. And in Hebrews, we're encouraged to run our race with endurance. The race set before us, looking unto Jesus, our inspiration, our model, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross, despising the shame and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. See, we're supposed to be inspired by Jesus, His journey on the cross. He's the genesis of our strength. He's also our inspiration. But then verse three, this is what it says. For consider Him, who? Jesus, who endured such hostility from sinners against Himself. That's everything we just read lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. In other words, here it is. We are without excuse when we consider the hostility of the six hours that he went through on the cross. 
And if he, in those six hours, could forgive those who hurt him, care for those who loved him, and reach those around him, that's our model. See, the cross, and maybe point that might just land this in the most profound way for you and me, is that the cross is a moment for all people, all time. And yet with this global, universal, eternal purpose, he had a heart for the one. You got to understand, he died for the sins of the world, yet he forgave the one nailing him in the moment. He died to reconcile all of humanity to God, and yet he reconciled Mary and John. He died to reach the entire world, and yet that mandate didn't stop him from reaching the sinner next to him. And all while he was in extreme pain. What a God, what a Saviour, what an example, what an opportunity. Maybe you feel consumed by a large responsibility. And yet in the middle of that, none of us took on what Jesus took on. And to combine that with the suffering and to see his broken, bleeding heart for the one. Can we stand together now? Can we stand all around the world, wherever you are? If you're physically able, join us as we're about to pray. You know, 2 Corinthians 3.18 says that we are transformed as we behold Him. You know, that message could sound so inspirational, but so out of reach. How do I crucify bitterness, selfishness, and introversion in the middle of my suffering? Well, let me tell you, you don't do it by trying harder. We're told that we are transformed by beholding longer. So while we're all standing, Maybe now's the time to forget about the person on your right, forget about the person on your left, forget about the people around you, just you and the Lord, behold the Lord. If closing your eyes helps, do that. If keeping it open is, that, that's fine. But just behold the Lord. Can you just take a moment to empty your mind of every other thought and distraction? And as I pray, and as we worship, let the worship that surrounds you right now be a moment of beholding Him. Father, we behold you right now. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for modeling something that seems so beyond all of us. And yet, God, I thank you that the cross didn't just save us. The cross is there to change us. Lord, we don't want to be settled with just being saved. We want to be transformed too. And so we behold you that your very nature as modeled by those six hours would truly change us. We worship you. We behold you, our Savior, our King. In Jesus' name, thank you, Father. Father's love for us How vast beyond all measure That He should care
that Jesus has won for my